Sorry for the, for the short presentation. Uh, um, like Paolo Canepel, I'm not a musicologist, as he told. I'm working for the Austrian Film Archive, uh, with parties in crime sometimes. And so I think it, it might be interesting for you, after so much analysis and, and theories, uh, to get a practical example of, of how a movie was sold with music. A movie was based on music, more or less based on an opera how it came into being, how the strange, uh, the strange things that happened during the production. Uh, in, in 2006, Filma in Austria, my institution, uh, made a restoration of the Austrian silent film Der Rosenkavalier, based on Richard Strauss' opera, Hooker von Hoffmann's style of Richard Strauss' opera, and together with Arte, we made this, this reconstruction. There have been reconstructions before, but none of them were really um, um, Based on, on, on the on the score, which uh, which Strauss left, and I will tell you about this strange story, which um, led to this this uh, film. On January 16, 1926, writing on occasion of the Austrian silent film Der Rosenkavalier's premiere, the German magazine Reichsfilmblatt asked which circumstances could have possibly caused the world famous Richard Strauss the famous Hugo von Hofnerstahl and the prominent Robert Wiener to convene for a joint work. Quote, who had the idea to film the Rosenkavalier? How did one how did one reach agreement? What did one argue about? What did one hope for? And what did one fear? Or did one in the end neither think or do anything at all, preferring instead to just hold a small horribilative to business meeting under the Pan films friendly roof. To know the facts in this matter would be of great interest in every respect, but we do not know them." End of quote. At a distance of almost 100 years, some of the, these questions can be answered. On November 22, 1911, in the year of the Rosenkavalier's premiere as an opera, Hugo von Hofmannsthal, in a letter, wrote of his wish for practical engagement with cinema. His ambition characterizes him as one of modernity's multimedia pioneers among writers. Quote, it is wrong to view every art form as definite. It is correct to consider every transition as a possibility. In 1923, he has his first thoughts about transforming the Rosenkalier into a screenplay for the first time. A film, as he defines his approach to the diplomat and historian Karl Jakob Burkhardt, one of his friends, a film is the resolution of an original drama into a novel. In other statements, he also affirms his views of silent film as a novel in pictures, for which a screenwriter, acting more as a storyteller than as a playwright, devises a plot of 250 to 300 visualized situations. Hofmannsthal repeatedly emphasizes that his interest in the Rosenkavalier is not a visually identical adaptation for the, of the opera, to a silent film, whose libretto he himself called the most untranslatable in the world. In response to his publisher Anton Fürstner's concerns about his undertaking, he claims not to be interested in a, in a congruent transfer of the stage action into the film screen, thus no competition is to be feared at the level of the theatre. He explicitly says that the film ought to portray not the stage action, but the prehistory of its characters. In this way, it could be possible to advertise it amongst an audience not normally inclined towards opera. Only a thoroughly awkward film, he said, will identically or very closely replicate the action of a stage play on the silent film screen. His film proposal for the Rosenkavalier stretches out a plot in which the opera's figures experience the things preceding the actual opera plot. Since the characters of his opera can be considered well known in most countries, just like Meremy's Carmen or Shakespeare's or Schiller's characters, uh, interest for them and for the opera can only be awakened, not diminished. Quote, and even for a country in which the opera were not known, I can honestly not imagine any publicity more efficient than this one, which in images evokes the wealth of the Viennese baroque milieu, the aristocratic splendor of the wagons and horses, 
and tells of the figures without even remotely showing their principal experiences as they will then be conjured up by the living theater, the singing voice." End of quote. Hofmannsthal has specific ideas for the film scores, imagining a completely composed musical accompaniment, a melodramatic potpourri nourished by the opera's motives, although they ought to be only suggested as leitmotifs, rather than literally executed. The actual problem, as Hofmannsthal realized all too well, was not so much the type of instrumentation, but rather Richard Strauss' general dislike of cinema, which was reinforced by the argument of some of his advisors. Hofmannsthal is likely targeting their publisher Fürstner when he responds to Strauss' concerns, quote, I put them down to a publisher's strangely passionate and jealous character, whose entire apathy, more so than he is aware, is directed against the institution of film, which he sees perhaps with some justification as damaging the institution of theater we hold so dear. The power of an institution which in Vienna attracts 200,000 people each day to its establishments, in my view, needs no justification of principle. In my view, it is all a matter of knowing by which means one can attract part of this flow onto one's own mill. End of quote. By no means does Hofmannsthal conceal that he is also motivated by financial interests, and he presents his calculations for what is possible both regionally and super regionally. Indeed, as an interested observer of the film medium, medium he plans his plans are even international in scope. Quote, the entire up and down between high and low profit is decided upon, a sing upon in a single moment that of the launch, or so to say, it with complete precision in two moments. In Dresden, where Strauss was supposed to uh, conduct the premiere, and in London, where the opera is enormously popular to an extent that I was actually quite astounded upon my visit during the July last year for England and America, end of quote. He emphasizes his having attentively followed the film industry for many years, which it is greatly known that where it is greatly known that stage writers increasingly allow their works to be turned into films. And furthermore, aiming at Strauss, quote, people who are accusing you of profit seeking have always existed. For their argument argumentation, it is entirely sufficient that the Rosenkavalier is made into a film at all. Whether it is also conducted by you or not changes nothing. Curiously, I have never heard a word said against, for example, Gerhard Hauptmann, giving all over his words to be turned into films and himself enthusiastically partaking in the execution, premiere, etc. End of quote. In 1925, Hoffmannsthal formulates his arguments to Strauss in view of posteriority. Quote, I would hold it very dear, beloved friend, if these considerations, which one day will find their place in the third volume of our correspondence, were not to leave you untouched entirely. End of quote. Hoffmannsthal wrote a treatment, and he defined clear guidelines for the opera. He had, uh, even in, in the beginning, when, when he wrote the opera, he had defined clear guidelines uh, in 1911. Quote, a work is one whole, and the work of two people can likewise become one. The threads run to and fro, related elements run together. The music should not be torn from the text, nor the word from the animated scene. This is made for the stage, not for the book or the individual sitting on his piano, end of quote. When he decided in 1923 to work upon the material himself, he consequently takes a pre-history approach to the opera's plot in his film treatment. Hofmannsthal begins his film treatment, which is, can still be found in the Austrian National Library in the Handschriftensammlung. He begins his film treatment in a French convent with Box of Lerkenau, one of the main characters of the opera, Aunt, a person he invents for this treatment. She adopts the dramatical function of the marshalling in the opera's first act, since she receives, surrounded by an illustrious menagerie, a group of paupers to whom she donates generously. Then she contemplates the infant portrait of her nephew, the Baron Ox. Hofmannsthal's plan, as we can see from his treatment, incorporate the use of crossfading as a stylistic filmic device. Quote from the treatment, 
the infant portrait of Baron Ox, an adorable little boy in a shirt next to a rocking horse, the boy waves a Turkish saber. Cut. How the Baron, Baron Ox looks in that very moment now. A first comical effect is achieved and the Baron is introduced into the plot. In detailed shots, garnished with burlesque scenes, Hoffmannsthal describes the blue-blooded Latin house, once noble and now shabby quarters. For the persona of the Marshalin, Hoffmannsthal instantly establishes her melancholy character. To her side, he places the Feldmarschall, her husband, who in the stage version is only mentioned. Hoffmannsthal again uses the possibility, or plan to use the possibilities of film, of the film medium, we first see the husband through the eyes of his wife as crossfade. Quote, for a moment she sees the hard, rigid face of the Fed Marshal in front of her. End of quote. The subject subject subjective viewpoint characterizes the man and his relationship to his wife without using words. Meanwhile, the plot shifts back to Lechenau's aunt approaching two further protagonists in the, into the plot, Faninal and his daughter Sophie. Also in this scene, Hofmeister uses the means of cinematography in order to characterize the size of Faninal's estate. He has the porters of a litter walk along a wall, seemingly so endless that they briefly can put down the, that they brief, that they put down the litter and wipe off their sweat before resuming their path. When she hears that Faninal's daughter is in a convent school, Baron Latinov's aunt decided, decides to visit her there. From her school, Sophie regularly watches the young Count Octavian Rofano, whereby the last of the main character of the original opera is integrated into the story. Lechina's aunt arrives and uh, spontaneously decided to marry the young Fanina to her nephew Ox of Lechina. The part of the intriguers in the opera, Anina and Balzaki, are allowed to move with complete ease between the main characters by the dramaturgy, their adaptation appears to have been the easiest for Hofmannsthal. As evidenced by the treatment, Hofmannsthal indeed intended to tell the story of the characters prior to the opera. Adding two characters, Latinos aunt and the Feldmarschall, enabled his approach and allowed the plot to be filled with new elements. Hofmannsthal adopted one central equation from the theatre, the interplay between burlesque motives and the sentimental plot. For the, for the former, he utilizes film de filmic devices such as slapstick. In one draft, he plans that the Baron Ox escaping in a coach breaks through the, his floor and is left lying on the country road. Another comical idea consists of a bell chain tearing off and Ox instead calling his servant by firing a pistol. The Marshal and Octavia meet during a hunt, the young man's courtship contrasts with the stiff martial demeanor of her husband. In the midst of this hunt, the Marshal tries to evade Octavian's courtship. News arrives that the Feldmarschall has suddenly been drafted and uh, as there is a new threat of conflict with the Turks. Hofmannsthal concludes as he intervened, as he intended to, just before the beginning of the opera. Ox prepares his journey to Vienna to pay his respect to Fanina and his daughter. The Feldmarschall returns from the field and Octavian waits beneath the Marshalin's window. The plot has caught up the time uh, of the libretto and could resume after the picturesque intermezzo provided by the overture with the opera's starting line, wie du warst, wie du nun bist, as you were, as you are now. The script of the Rosenkavalier film was finally written by the actor and screenwriter Louis Nerz together with the director Robert Wiener. Hofmeister did not participate in the writing, although his name was obviously used for his, for its promotional value. The people in charge of the Panfield company paid only small attention to, this, to his treatment, preferring instead to use some of his motives as an expansion of the familiar stage plot with which nonetheless against Hofmannsthal's opposition now came to form the basis of the film. As in the opera, we find the Marshalin at the film's beginning, abandoned by her husband and courted by the young court Count Octavian Rofano. Her cousin, Baron of, of Latino, travels to Vienna and to wed the daughter of the new Herr von Feinberg. 
days later when we see um, when act, uh, Octavian is acting as a matchmaker for Ox, he hands over the silver rose. I It's, it's, uh, it's like in the opera, the same scenery, uh, the same characters. Um, as you could see in the outside, the coach. But when, when I was would I like would I would have liked to show is the approach of the Rosen Cavalier in his coach is in the opera reported by a chambermaid. And here, of course, you can see the the, the, the coaches, the horses, and, and the livery. And so, so this is where, where they used uh, the filming devices. Mertin Wiener only picked up Hoffmann's last treatment in a parallel plot. One sees the third marshal standing in the field as he is informed of his wife's infidelity and subsequently travels to Vienna. The last third of the movie combines the two strands leading into a completely new ending. The third marshal appears unannounced at a masked party hosted by his wife. Octavian falls the planned marriage between Ox and Sophie with an intrigue. Now the marshal suddenly confronts him with his rapier. A masked female throws herself between the two men, but contrary to the marshal's belief, it is Sophie, not his wife. Joining them, the marshal clears up the misunderstanding, and the film finishes with a compromise. A compromising note, the present and future spouses are joined by the intriguers Valsaki and Anina as who form a third loving couple. If and how Hoffmeister's treatment could have been successfully turned into a film can only be a subject for speculation. It is certain that the actual film plot contradicts the poet's intention in almost every respect. The first newspaper reports still refrained a conciliatory note. Quote, Together, Hugo von Hoffmeister, the poet, and Richard Strauss, the composer, personally arranged their work for cinema purposes, and that naturally gives the film its special appeal. The plot deviates substantially from the opera, only a few scenes run in parallel, then the events run their own course, end of quote. 
The actual problem that led to the split between the poet and the Pan Film Company was caused by the company's decision to deviate almost completely from Hoffman's style treatment and rely on the well-established opera front. Thus, a dramatical problem was created, which Hoffmannsthal very consciously sought to avoid. By undressing the text protagonist, one naturally loses essential components of the work. Most afflicted by this problem is probably the Marshalling, played by the French actress Huguette Duflo, whose statements of melancholy realism represent the opera's basic mood. On the occasion of the film premiere, the German magazine Reichsfilmblatt points to her in particular, stating, quote, that the Rosenkavalier, as we know, as we know, it has not been filmed, only the label was rem has remained. It doesn't exactly have to be something bad, but something else with a misleading title, end of quote. With regard to the opera characters Hofmannsthal had observed, they all belong together, and what is best lies between them. It is fleeting and eternal. The role of Octavian on stage, the part of a young man sung by a mezzo-soprano, is one of, most, of, of the most prominent richest parts in opera literature. Since the opera was realized as a silent film, no female singer was needed for a young man's voice. Therefore, the French actor Jacques Catlin was cast for the role. Even contemporary sources described his acting as more feminine than boyish. The exception are the, the scenes where he's dressed up as a chambermaid, where his exaggerated comic style is justified. As in the libretto, Funny Night is conceived as a comic figure and this is and thus realizable by means of pantomime, like was Anina in Hosaki as the intriguers. The easiest acting job is Michael Bonen's interpretation of Baron Ox of Lerke. Now you saw him dance in the, in the, in the film. The learned opera singer Bonen has, is already familiar with the part from the stage experience. Thanks to his vis comica, he is also able to show a convincing performance of the burlesque character in the silent medium as a pantomime. When they were conceiving the opera, Hofmannsthal and Strauss were always in agreement on Ox foreseeable, particularly popularity amongst the public. For a while, Strauss even considered naming the opera after him, suggesting Box of Lechner and the Silver Rose. As source material for the Baroque Viennese flair on the opera stage, Hofmeister resorted to diaries, novels and plays, but above all paintings and engravings. The stage production were inspired by paintings of Antoine Bateau, François Boucher, Fagonard or William Hogarth. The aesthetic was also used upon was used for the cinematographic production. The shooting took place, you could see some of the scenes. The shooting took place in the Schönbrunn studios as well as on exterior locations such as the Schönbrunn Palace, the Viennese Belvedere and the Prata, as well as low, uh, a country in Lower Austria where Baron Box of Lechenau's decayed castle was situated. For the set design, the film company was able to hire the man who already had been responsible for the opera premiere in Dresden in 1911, thus creating the role model for numerous other productions, Alfred Roller. Roller became chief decorator of the Viennese court opera in 1903. Cooperating closely with the opera's director, Gustav Mahler, he worked on reforming productions in order to align them with the idea of total synthesis of the arts combination of stage design, light, music, text, and action. After a few years' work at the Viennese Burgtheater, Roller returned to the Opera House under the direction of Franz Scheib and Richard Strauss in 1918 and created the set designs for all Strauss premieres in Vienna. The movie's director was Robert Wiener, who already produced Pension Gronen and Rolax Hände in Austria in 1923 for the Pan Film Company, and is today identified above all with his film, The Cabinet des Dr. Caligari, Germany, 1920. As early as, as January 1926, film magazine claimed to have caught wind of Hofmannsthal and Wiener having not quite liked each other. Shortly after the premiere, Hofmannsthal expresses discontent, his, his discontent about the Rosenkavalier's realization. Quote, in those years, I completed several outlines for films, including The Rosenkavalier, really quite pretty, novelesque, wherein I showed the existence of all the figures before the opera plot sets in. 
it would, on, it would only have appeared in the last 30 images. Mr. Wiener, to whom I gave this outline, ignored it completely and turned the opera plot into the most bumbling and plump film imaginable, end of quote. What would a successful opera, silent film opera, would have like, looked like? In the view of the participants, Strauss, Hoffmann, Stahl, Roller, Wiener, opera fans expected a homogeneous adaptation of the stage action, conserving all the benefits of one art form by being transferred into a different one, a sort of squaring of the circle. The desired result might be best described as a silent video to which music can then be played live. But the mere filming of the stage action necessarily and in many ways conflicted with the concept of silent film which a liberal adaptation endangered, the, while, while a, a liberal adaptation endangered the synchronization of a given musical concert. Thus, a middle path had to be found whose golden truth was most likely to manifest itself in the shareholders' purses, through, although this, this hope wasn't fulfilled for everyone. The cinema as an educational venue in which art films offering short versions of literally classics was already well established. A stage play like Bill and Tell or Romeo and Juliet, which in the theater or for the reading would take three hours, can be seen in the cinema in half the time. The Rosenkavalier was a silent film derived from an opera. The text thus had to be shortened to a diminishing effect. As opposed to Carmen, or to say, to stay with Strauss, Salome or Lecter, the plot isn't based on an archaic conflict, uh, which can be rendered in, in simplified form as a pantomime with few intertitles, and therefore Hoffmann Stahl wanted to shoot a prequel. In the letter in which Hoffmann Stahl tells Strauss of his considerations concerning the filming of the Rosenkavalier, he still names Robert Wiener equally with Ernst Lubitsch which might lead to Billy Wilder's motto, how would Lubitsch do it? As the Viennese scriptwriter and director Walter Reich recounts, the Rosenkavalier was amongst the projects which Lubitsch would have liked to work on. In 1918, Ernst Lubitsch filmed Carmen as the 11th cellular version of the material with Paula Negri in the reading role. However, just like Cecil B. De Mille had done three years earlier, he referred to Merimé rather than Bizet making no attempts to confront the dramaturgical problems of a silent film opera, avoiding every kind of stage cliché, and concentrating on the dramatic interplay of the characters themselves. Robert Wiener in his version of the Rosenkavalier had no such way out. His film is a compromise between the prehistoric prehistory conceived by Hoffmann Stahl and the familiar stage action. Due to a numerous singular circumstances of its creation, the Rosenkavalier has long since earned his, play, his place, its place in film history. Even ten years after the premiere in 1936, one could still read possibly a claim of an, an anonymous writer, saying that among uh, he, wasn't, he wasn't really uh, interested in silent film, but one of the few exceptions was the Rosenkavalier. One of the problems, one of the project's aims was to improve film music in general. It was pointed out that Strauss, as probably the first and so far only musician of repute, has provided the film's accompaniment. It was argued, on this, uh, it was argued and, it, and the topic Richard Strauss and, and cinema is a story of, of conflict. In 1921, one could read, quote, Richard Strauss is writing a film symphony intended as an accompaniment for an American film drama. This piece of news has caused a sensation of the greatest magnitude in film musicians, and the audience and might become the milestone of the revolutionary changes in the field of cinema music, end of quote. This announcement put out in 1921 by the film magazine Die Filmwelt sounded sensational, but turned out to be wrong. The relationship, or rather chronic non-relationship, between Richard Strauss and the cinema is primarily deducible from letters. In 1930, Strauss informed his friend, the composer and conductor Max von Schilling, of his refusal to take charge of the music for a two-hour version of Wagner's Der Ring des Liebenungen. In 1940, he confessed to conductor Clemens Krauss the danger posed to the entire standard power culture by film is uh, 
can no longer be dismissed or be politely ignored. The adaptation of the opera score for the silent film was not undertaken by Strauss himself, but by his long-standing collaborators Otto Singer and Karl Alvin. For the musical arrangement of the additional plots, elements were used that don't appear in the opera. They resort to some pieces composed by Strauss for other purposes, prior to the of the film, such as a military presentation march in the flat major, and the Königs March in E-flat major, as well as the third piece uh, of a ceremonial with the very filmic title, Lebende Bilder zu den Feierlichkeiten der Goldenen Hochzeit des Großherzogs und der Großherzogin von Weimar, written in 1892. <coughs> in case of the Rosenkavalier Strauss was persuaded to advertise the film. In a newspaper paper article he theorized, quote, Music accompanying film should just be should, could, shouldn't just be background. It must be organically linked to the conflict and the plot's deeper meaning. A different case is presented in opera films. Here the music is already available. Here the figures are already musically characterized. And since the film is likely to broaden the plot and multiply the locations, but will follow the original, it is not all too complicated to adapt the music for the opera music for film. I am very much in favor of turning popular operas into film, and it is my op opinion that the Rosenkavalier, which Robert Wiener has now filmed and which has become an excellent work of film, will thus contribute to popularize the opera. It would be most I would be most pleased if the Rosenkavalier film finds new friends amongst masses and the popular film opera. The problem. Yeah, Strauss directed uh, two uh, premieres, one in, in Dresden and one in London, and the problem was also that um, the, the premiere was, was not a success because Strauss was a typical stage conductor. Uh, if you watch an opera, if you watch opera singers, you will, you will find them singing their tune, uh, looking at their, uh, their partner, but with one eye looking at the conductor who will tell them to uh, slow down or, or get faster. And so, when in, in, in film, uh, Strauss just uh, conducted his his, uh, his motives, and were uh, when when the scene was already finished, they had to stop the film. Strauss was completing his motive, and then the film went on. So it was about uh, the film had now has 135 minutes, and it took over three hours to, to stage it in, in Dresden. Richard Strauss' personal relationship and experiences with, uh, with film turned out to be unsatisfying, but was probably, which was probably all this, it turned out to his, um, to his being more a stage expert and his unwillingness to, to fully engage with the nature of the new art form. The fact that Strauss, amongst others, nonetheless became a particular reference for film music composers is simple to explain. Many ideas of, of scoring a movie were based on classic examples on programme music and symphonic poems, a form in which Strauss was a master, as he showed in Till Eulenspiegel's Mary Franks, Don Quixote, or Don Juan. If you assemble the elements of these archetypes, and we may add Strauss Macbeth, um, almost any possible film character can be a musical portrait. Thank you.